I missed Earth. I think I, I was ready to appreciate Earth, being around lots of people, and there's no weather in space, and you see the beauty of the planet when you're up there, and then you get to engage it when you get down on Earth, which is kind of cool. You have a different perspective on things. All right, Dr. Mike Massimino, you're a legit astronaut. You've been to space. Yeah. Yep. So you got to tell me, is the Earth flat? Yeah. So, Thomas, we can cross that off the list of worries. It is, huh. it is round. Huh. Most definitely round. Um, and that's, yeah, I think there's a lot of other things for people to be worried about uh, than whether or not it's round or flat. We, we've checked that, that one off. All right. Yeah, I can guarantee you it's round. I don't know what I'm going to do now. Um, Have you, you been worried about this? I've been worried for a while, but... Really? Yeah, I figured it was all just in the illusion. Anyway, I mean... Nah, it's, there's no way to hide that. No. Well, after today's video, I encourage you to try colostrum. You've probably heard people talking about it before. There's a company called Armra. Now, colostrum is not a supplement. It's more of a whole food. Okay, so in this particular case, Armra is 100% bovine colostrum that comes after the calves have been fed. So it's perfectly sustainable, but also comes from grass-fed cows, but also from a co-op of dairy farmers. So it's ensuring really high quality product. Now what's interesting about this colostrum from Armra is that it is not heat pasteurized like most colostrum, making it the most bioavailable colostrum that you can find. What that means is that like when you heat pasteurize it, it breaks everything down, the 400 different living nutrients that are in colostrum. So with their cold chain technology, it makes it so that it's ensuring the delivery of this stuff. The way that I've been using colostrum is to help with recovery. There's some literature that suggests that it's up to a 50% increase in recovery. Obviously very good for the gut. It can help rebuild that gut barrier, but overall just gives you a good sense of feeling energized and feeling recovered. So that link down below is going to get you 15% off. It's tryarmra.com slash Thomas. Again, that's tryarmra.com slash Thomas. So check them out. Let's talk about the body. Yeah. That's what I really want to kind okay, of dive cool. into. You've yeah. got some really interesting uh, just background. Mm -hmm. I definitely want to go into the mindset piece. I want to go into that. But like people that are watching my mm -hmm. kind of content, they're, yeah. they're smart people. They like to understand what's happening mm -hmm. at even a biochemical level. I just, I mean, mm -hmm. Not that I'm expecting you to talk all about that. but I can make it up. <laughs> what happens mm -hmm. to your body in space? And we yeah. can talk about this in different categories. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's break it down first. How is nutrition different mm -hmm. in space and why is it different? So, uh, all right, so nutrition, the food's pretty good in space. Would you expect that to be the answer? Not at Thomas? all. Okay, so I think we think of it as like out of tubes and like gushy stuff. Or that That's the way it was, I think, for the very first astronauts. But <laughs> but uh, nutrition is very important for to nourish your body, but also uh, for like a psychological helper kind of thing. You know, no one wants to eat crap. So, uh, so the food is actually pretty good, it's prepared. Uh, by our dietitians, and they they look at your body weight and and try to judge how many calories you're going to need per day. And but they give you on your menu a pretty well balanced diet. So a lot of time goes into it. Um, it's also it's I hear we uh, for for doing spacewalks right. So spacewalks are fairly long exercises where you're moving the whole time. And um, we had five spacewalks on my missions back to back, but we had two teams splitting them up. So we were doing this every other day going out there and spacewalking. And we had an athletic trainer there, her name was Beth Shepard. She had worked with uh, Rice University uh, football team and, and other teams. And I remember her, her telling me that she thought, now this is interesting, maybe what you might think, or some of your viewers, um, she said, she told me that she thought that overtime games, you know, when you got into an overtime game in football, basketball, extra innings in baseball, whatever it might be, she thought that those were won and lost based on nutrition because you're fatigued, you're tired, you know, how much do you have left? And she said it's two very evenly matched teams or people going at it or whatever it might be when you get to that point and that you really need to rely on, your, on good nutrition to get you through those last couple, those last few innings, those last few moments, whatever it might be. And she felt the same thing with her spacewalking because at the end of a six and a half hour, some of my spacewalks were longer than that, seven, eight, eight hours, one over eight hours, you're, you're moving the whole time and you're mentally drained and you're, you're fatigued. And that's, that's what she was, her point was make sure you eat well. So nutrition was a big part of it. Also preparing yourself beforehand, make sure you eat healthy before you go to space and you try to be as healthy as you can and then try to maintain a good diet while you're up there. It's a little harder to do up there, not, not just because of the food maybe, but, um, but you can find things. Like you can, fresh, fresh fruit was a problem, but you could have dried fruit. 
fresh vegetables are an issue. They're growing them now in the International Space Station, but you could bring vegetable dishes. And we had all really good food. We had shrimp cocktail, you could have steak, uh, uh, Chinese food, all kinds of stuff. It was either dehydrated where you'd add water or just meals ready to eat, like from the military where you'd warm them up. Um, so the variety and the and the quality of food I thought was uh, was was really was really good, um, but uh, the other issues that affect your nutrition is your digestion. So you not uh, uh, gravity helps us uh, digest our food. John uh, John Young, uh, who was a very accomplished astronaut, maybe more more accomplished than any other astronaut in history, six space flights, the very first Gemini flight he was on. He was in the second group of astronauts. Um, he was, he went to the moon twice. He orbited on Apollo 10, walked on the moon on Apollo 16, and was the first commander of the space shuttle and then flew another space shuttle mission, was still an active astronaut when, uh, when we were, when I was there. He, he was in his 60s, late 60s, still flying a T-38. And I was, he was my boy, one of my boyhood heroes with Neil Armstrong and Rashom. Anyway, coming back on a trip from California, we're in a T-38, we're flying over New Mexico, and I asked him what was it like on the moon. And he said, Mike, uh, the best thing about it is you can finally take a dump, is what he said to me. And that's, that's kind of funny, and I was like, huh? But what it was is that you're floating around in space, your digestion doesn't work as well as it would, because gravity kind of helps you. And he said he got to the moon, one six gravity was just enough so he could let loose. But, but what, what can happen to you in space is, uh, is that you're kind of not regular, right? So my, uh, we've learned about that. Between, between my first and my second flight is we started using more supplements like Metamucil. I don't know if you... Mm -hmm. You, uh, you say yeah, that's so, kind of thing? Psyllium is one of the... I mean, okay, yeah, right, right, that's what that stuff is, right? So, in fact, I know that because we couldn't call it Metamucil because that's a brand... That's like <laughs> of course, a right. So we would call it by whatever that other stuff yeah, was that you mentioned. Yeah, that's yeah. the way they labeled it, you know, so because it's a government program and they, yep. it actually was Metamucil. So we started taking that ahead of time. We also eat a lot of fruit. We had dried fruit on, on board that we would eat. So you'd want to keep, you want to keep your body regular, keep your digestion going, keep, keep eating like you should, make sure you get the right calories. Hydration is really important. You tend to pee more in space because your, your fluid shifts to your upper extremity. So your brain thinks you have more fluid than you normally do and you, it tells you to pee. So you, especially the first couple of days, you'll pee more than you, than you probably need to. So that means you have to, you have to drink a lot of fluids or else you'll get dehydrated. So those are, those are some of the things. And I, I, I've, again, I found that trying to set that up before going to space, like making sure you're on a on a you know a good diet, well hydrated, doing what you need to get the supplements going so that things are working the way they should. Um, that was good to set that up and then continue in space. And it it affect it affected your performance. And we're getting we were all and I was in my I was in my late thirties and then I guess mid forties. My my I wasn't a young kid, yeah. you know. And so these were the things that were important for us uh, to make to give us a better chance of being successful. So when you think about the time prior to going to space, mm -hmm. I mean, that's something that even I didn't really think of, <clears throat> didn't think of at first. You're thinking, okay, I I'm sure you're having series of uh, blood draws prior to going to space, perhaps some, looking yeah. at some of these things. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I know just from basic, you know, mm -hmm. metabolics that yeah. it's really like a 90 day lag a lot of times, like what you put yeah. in your body today yeah. may not manifest in your blood work for, you know, 60, yep. 90 days, you look at HbA1c or, you know, your glycolated hemoglobin, yeah. which is your, essentially your, like a yeah. lagging indicator of your blood sugar. Yeah. I mean, that 90 day sort of leading indicator is really important for you. Yeah. Um, so I didn't really think about it like yeah. that. So was there a specific protocol or was it just a matter of, hey, like the 60 days prior to launch, like you guys really need to like keep protein high. I mean, yeah. I, I guess I'd be concerned mostly with like catabolism, like muscle breakdown. Like, yeah. do you lose a good degree of muscle? Are they focused on getting you more protein prior to and during? They, they, uh, they really have only have control over what we eat when we get, not really they have control. They would, they would cook for us uh, when we were in, uh, in, in uh, crew quarters. So our food was prepared by the cooks and crew quarters. We went into quarantine so that we wouldn't get sick. It was Got the it. idea. Uh, and that was typically seven days before launch. You would enter quarantine in Houston and then fly to the Cape. And then they had another quarantine facility at the Kennedy Space Center. So you were kind of on your own. Um, they did have dietitians we could work with. But I kind of, it was interesting. Like, as your launch date comes up, um, I don't know if this is for everybody, but like, the way I saw it was the, intense, the intensity that I had to devote to that, both from 
physical fitness and diet and and having everything jammed in my head that I needed to and really concentrate. I couldn't do that over like years. Yeah. Like I think I'd go out of my mind, right? So I felt like between, you kind of kicks in, like it starts like nine months ahead of time. Like, uh, you know, I've got this thing coming up, you know, I better start watching things, you know, and making sure I'm as healthy as I possibly can as far as fitness level goes. And like if you described having your, your body with, with healthy stuff inside of it and being regular, like once, I, this may sound nuts, but the, the morning dump and then you're finished, that's really important in space. Going to the bathroom will take up a lot of time. So you want to be really efficient about it. You don't want to be bound up, you know? So I was, you get yourself regular, you do what you need to do. And, and I think it was, it started around nine months and then it got really intense at six months for me. And it wasn't like anyone was telling me that. I just felt like that was what I, what I did. And I think a lot of people did that too. Where they remember, we're not missing a day in the gym. We are gonna eat healthy, no crap. We're gonna get our sleep. Uh, we're gonna do everything we need to to be as healthy as we can. And I think that that really super duper kicked in like at six months. Yeah. Because you realize it's gonna affect your performance and you wanna do well. You've been given a big responsibility, particularly with us, you know, space walking on the Hubble Space Telescope. It was glorious to get a chance to do that. But it's also, you know, you don't wanna mess that up. That's an opportunity of a lifetime. Getting picked as an astronaut was great. And then getting an assignment like that is really, really special. And you want to make sure you do the best you can, and and you're relying on your on your your health to be able to perform at the level you need it to be. Yeah, I mean, if you transition onto the the fitness side per se, so mm -hmm. you're saying that uh, spacewalking is mm -hmm. pretty demanding. Is it? Yeah. Would you say that it's more demanding neurologically because you're like just things are different, yeah. or musculoskeletally? Like, is it is it different? Like, is yeah. it? lactic acid burn as if you were sprinting or is it more like this is mentally taxing because I actually have to be really cognizant of how I'm yeah. moving my body. I think it's both. Yeah. And I think one goes hand in hand with the other. It wasn't necessarily a sprint. I wouldn't say that. It's more like a long distance run, I guess. Again, more like a marathon because it's, it's, it's a long time that you're out there. And depending on your role, like sometimes you're on the robot arm and that thing's moving you around wherever you need to go. And so you're, you're still engaged mentally, but you're not moving yourself around as much. You gotta do some things. But the other side of it, which I did primarily on my second flight, usually it's for the more experienced spacewalker, um, is to free float, which means you're moving under your own. I wasn't on the arm at all my, my second flight. I was always moving around on my own. And so that was you know, physically demanding. The suit, you, you gotta be smart about it too. The suit is pressurized, which means you're, push, you're pulling against four and a half 4.3 PSI in the suit on your gloves so your, your hands can get fatigued. The suit weighs a lot. So the training exercise is in the pool. It's about a 200 pound suit. And then you put another 100 pounds of tools on it and then you get inside of it. And then, so our, our training in the water, they would try to make us neutrally buoyant, which meant you're floating in the water column. So you have flotation and weight. So you're kind of floating in the water, similar to the way you'd be floating uh, in space. But you saw the, the weight of the suit and of the tools and other things. And, and, I, we went through a, a rash of, uh, of um, sh I had one shoulder repair of shoulder injuries because of the suit. I think they've gotten better at preventing those now, learning things. But, um, but that motion in the pool was, was physically, more physically demanding what people would, would think maybe than it was in space because you're floating around in space. But in space now, you do have that added mental dimension to it that you're in space, right? So, you know, now everything's like pretty intense out there. You know, it's really cool and everything and amazing, but, but it also adds that extra dynamic to it in your head that, you know, this is really serious. So I think it was a combination. And again, the, especially toward the end, you had to be really careful at, at the end of spacewalks. You, we tried to design them so you weren't doing anything monumental in that, you know, those last that last hour or so, because that's when you're more inclined to make mistakes. And I think it's, I think the mental fatigue can, I think also affect how you feel physically, but also the physical fatigue. If you start getting fatigued physically, I think it's also gonna affect your ability to think. So the better you can feel mentally and physically, um, I, I think is, was pretty important for us. And again, we were older people. You know, we were, so I was in the best shape of my life when I was in my 40s, which you know, might not be typical of most people, but it was, it was for me and, and many of my colleagues. So it was a lot of your training much more, would you say it was skewed more towards aerobic fitness uh, and then the rest very practical, kind of technical, like with the suit versus, hey, go pound some weights sort of thing? No, it was, it was both. So yeah. we had, uh, and they, as, as the, a lot of this was driven by spacewalking. 
because they, when I was, when I arrived as a new astronaut, they really didn't have that much spacewalking experience on the space shuttle. But that was going to, they call it the wall of EVA. So I only had like a couple spacewalks over the first, I don't know, 15 years of the space shuttle program, believe it or not. There really wasn't much reason to go out there and do stuff. Sometimes I had to do, a lot of it was figuring out how to do spacewalks in, in zero gravity. Uh, they had done them on the moon. That's a little bit different. You're kind of walking around there. They had some zero gravity ones on the, on the way back from the moon as well, but not much. So they were going to need to build a space station, and they were servicing the Hubble Space Telescope. So all of a sudden, being able to spacewalk was important for just about everyone who was there as, a, as an astronaut. So it started to get um, a lot more attention. And with that, uh, going to the gym became a, a, a different uh, requirement. It was, I think before that it was, you know, get your exercise, whatever you're interested in. And if you like to run, run. If you like to lift weights, lift weights, or whatever it is, right? But once I, th I think the requirement for spacewalking came in, at least my observation right when I arrived, that's when they started hiring uh, these, these uh, what they called ACERs. It was Astronaut Strength, and Condi Astronaut Strength Conditioning and Rehab. ACERs <laughs> is what they call it as the acronym. And so they were there to put science behind it. And a lot of them had trained, as I mentioned, like my, my friend Beth had trained with the, the Rice football team. Uh, Corey Twine was a trainer for the Michigan State team. And then, then he went to Michigan. I thought it was a plot to ruin Michigan because he didn't like Michigan when he was at Michigan State <laughs> as a student. And he left NASA to go to Michigan. Watch what's going on here. And he ended up, so he was like a college football. Uh, and he was like, I think he was the head strength coach at, at these places. And we had other guys that had worked with other sports teams, professional teams. And there was, so they were hired to, uh, to help us get ready. And it was, um, it was, a, it was a combination of weights and some CrossFit stuff and, and, and aerobic stuff. It was kind of like an aerobic workout that included weight training. So it was a lot of moving, a lot of in, intermixed sets. And again, you're dealing with an older population, but they didn't want us necessarily to be you know, just uh, muscle bound without having the flexibility. So it also, it also dealt with flexibility and endurance and other things they would do to us. And they had a pretty good schedule of things that we would do throughout a course of a week. We would try to get to the gym four times a week. And if we were traveling, they would make suggestions of what we could do while we were on travel. When you would return from a mm -hmm. mission, yeah. I would imagine that there's a lot of weird changes that are happening in your body. Mm -hmm. Were there guidelines as to, hey, nothing physically demanding for X amount of time, mm -hmm. like wait for, I'm sure there's pressurization changes. I'm sure there's, uh, you know, all kinds of different, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, nitrogen balancing and everything that's mm -hmm. kind of happening. Uh, was, what were the guidelines like there? I mean, or, or and did you feel sort of superhuman? I mean, it's kind of interesting. It's like if you were to go up, obviously, in theory, if you went up to altitude for two months or something like that, yeah. and you came back down, you'd feel amazing, but you're pressurized, yeah. things are different. Like, did you feel like all of a sudden red blood cell saturation, you're like, ah, I feel amazing, or is it the opposite? Yeah, I don't know. I never thought of like red blood. I didn't know we had that. We should have had this conversation 20 years ago. But uh, but uh, the one the one thing that made you feel better, and it was 100% oxygen. We used to decide what we would breathe that in our spacesuits and sometimes in the jet, and that was a good thing to make you feel better. Um, we did have some lower altitude. Um, we would depress the cabin to a lower altitude uh, to help us prepare to prevent against the bends from when we because the spacewalks were down to 4.3 psi, so we're normally at 14.7 sea level, and that's the way the cabin for the space shuttle and the space station was. But on our flights, we would depress the cabin of the shuttle 24 hours prior to the first spacewalk. So you're breathing a, a 10.2, which is uh, a higher altitude, less oxygen, so you don't feel as well. But th those are, you know, they get like a little bit of headache, sort of. You're not feeling as great because you're not, you're not getting all that oxygen that you normally would get. Um, but then you'd breathe 100% O2, and that yeah. would make you feel better. But, but it was more um, uh, for, the, for the rehab part of it. And for the exercise part of it, for, without the spacewalk part of it, was that if you don't, when you're floating around in space, it's like being on super duper bed rest because you're not really doing anything. You're not walking around, you're not getting up, you're not even sitting up, you're just floating around the whole time. So uh, if you don't do anything, you're gonna, for a couple weeks even, you know, you're gonna atrophy and feel a little bit weaker, but nothing necessarily major when you, when you come back. But if you were to do that for six months, you're, you're, you're going to lose bone mass and uh, you're going to lose uh, muscle mass. Your heart will shrink. A lot of bad things will happen to you if, you're, uh, if you do, do that. Don't do anything for six months floating around in space. So there's a two-hour exercise period on the space station six days a week. 
That includes the prep and the post, you know, cleanup and all that. But they're doing um, aerobic stuff on the, we had a, an exercise bike on the shuttle. So they have an exercise bike on the space station. They also have a treadmill on the space station. So the space station is long duration flights. You're up there for six months. I mean, even if you don't do any spacewalks, you have to exercise while, you, while you're up there or else you get all these bad things happen to your body. And then they also have a resistive exercise device. It's called ARED for advanced resistive exercise device. And it's not, you, you know, you can go up there with all these weights you got over here in the gym. You go up with all that stuff and lift them like nothing. You know, I got a 600 pound solar array and I'm moving around. No weight to it in space, right? But that's not going to do you any good if you're trying to work out. So, so it's, it's a resistive device where you're pulling against like, we had TheraBands on the shuttle. That's what we would use to get just a little bit of resistive exercise. On the space station for the long duration guys where it's much more important. They have this pretty fancy a device that goes against springs and pulleys and these resistive TheraBand kind of things. And you can get a really good workout. You can reconfigure it. So you could do squats and deadlifts and bench press and curls and everything that you can imagine you can do on this thing because you're pulling against something like a like a spring or a, or a theraband kind of workout. But it's really good. So so that's important to try to maintain your fitness level um, so that when you come back to Earth, you don't have all these bad things. If you were to stay in space forever, you can float around without a problem. But but coming back to Earth when you have to deal with gravity again, that's when you can have some issues. The warnings they had for us to try to answer your question, was everything settling back in. So the your spine grows in space. So like our spine is kept into its position because we because we have gravity working on it. So in space, all that kind of lets loose and you'll gain about an inch and a half in your spine. So we sized our spacesuits to be an inch and a half longer in the waist ring there. So we could we wouldn't get jammed inside of it because everyone expands their height. Um, you lose that when you come back to Earth. You can't keep hard. going to space, you become a giant. You know, it's not going to happen. So you lose that, it settles back in. And when it's settling back in, that's when you got to be careful. So you're not supposed to pick anything up, like, you know, the temptation not to pick up your kids, which you ignore and you pick them up anyway when they're little, when you see them when you come back from space. And, but you're not supposed to do that or pick anything, do no sudden motion, because they've had a couple of guys pop this in their neck or something when they get up too quickly or try to lift something. So you're not supposed to do that for a couple of days. Um, the other thing that is the most... Um, uh, obvious thing that happens when you get to space and then the first thing you'll notice when you get back is the change in your vestibular system hmm. because our vestibular system works on gravity so we can do things like you know fly an airplane drive a car ride a bicycle catch a football throw a baseball whatever it might be all these things are hand-eye coordination right all that we're able to do that stuff because we're moving around and our head and nose we're moving and our eyes are tracking and everything's fine <clears throat> when it come, when has, when there's a conflict in that like uh, some people might get seasick or air sick or happened to me sometimes when I first moved to New York City when I was trying to read in the back of a cab and it's a bumpy because your eyes are saying you're stationary because you're reading something, but your inner ear is getting excited with all these bumps. When you get a conflict between the two, it leads to nausea and you barf sometimes, right? You can get, you get that sickness. So in space, it happens like for the opposite reason because you're moving around and you, your eyes are saying, telling the brain, hey, we're moving around here. And the inner ear is saying you are perfectly still. Like it's, there's no input at all to the inner ear, no matter what you do, because there's no gravity present. So that conflict leads to nausea. I barfed my, barfed my first time in space, my first day in space. I didn't feel well at all because of that conflict. They didn't know about this until they made spaceships big enough that people could move around in them. And uh, there's an adaptation. It goes away pretty much after the first day. But that first day is when you, you start feeling crappy. But what happens... After that first day, the brain stops listening to the inner ear. It's like, I don't pay any attention to you anymore. We're just going with this eyesight. But what I noticed was, like my first day, that in, if I would go upside down, which is kind of a fun thing to do in space, it, I didn't feel that I was upside down. Hmm. Like, if you hold me upside down in here, I'll know I'm upside down, right? Blood rushes to my head. My, you know, my, my inner ear knows what's going on. My, and it, you know, it, it, it agrees with what my eyes are seeing. When I went upside down in space, I felt like I was perfectly still, but the room had rotated 180 <laughs> degrees. And that freaked me out, because I don't like this, and I went the other way right away. But after you know, two or three days, that all settles in, uh, and you don't notice it, really. You can be in almost any position, and you're fine. But coming back to Earth, there's the issue, because now it all gets, you know, gets near your own gravity again, and you're, you're all wigged out, and you feel, I felt like I was going to fall over. So we're not allowed to drive a car or fly a plane and do anything like that. Uh, for the first couple of days until you get checked out by the flight surgeon that everything's working like it should again. 
So those are some of the restrictions when we come back. I mean, speaking, that's a good segue with the, the mindset piece and mm -hmm. like what happens to your brain. I mean, the first time you went into space, mm -hmm. was it, I mean, just to be like blunt mm -hmm. here, I mean, was it liberating? Was it depressing? Were you kind of like, wow, this is uh, like my family's at home, everything's there, like I'm yeah, yeah. seeing this. I can't imagine yeah. the sensation yeah. that would come over you and probably just the wave of different emotions. I mean, everyone wants to talk about what's happening to the physical body, but not everyone knows what's happening in the body, but mm -hmm. you have an idea of how you feel and what's happening there. I mean, what did that mm -hmm. feel like? Um, it, it, it was... Uh, it was extraordinary. I don't know if, and, and what I mean by that, it was, it was kind of like just so different. Um, and and a, you're, we were really well trained. I mean, I'd been an astronaut for six years, pretty much training that whole time. I trained for four years before my, before my first flight and then got assigned. And then I had uh, another year and a half of flight specific training to get ready for my first space flight. So it was about, about five and a half years from the time I was selected until I flew in space. So I, I kind of knew what I was, what I was going to get, was getting myself into. So it wasn't like I didn't know what was happening, but just the way you experience everything, everything's floating around. I mean, they try to get you, accumulate, you know, ready for that, but it's hard to, to get ready for zero gravity on earth because there's no way to really simulate that. We can do it in an airplane that does parabolas and you can float for about 30 seconds and have an idea. And then in a pool with the spacewalking prepared us very well for our spacewalks. But just the, the, the zero gravity and being off the planet and these changes that are going on with your body, you know, the nausea, the pain, the back hurts a little bit, especially that first night because that spine, spinal growth is going on. And so there's a bit of an adaptation going there. And I remember my first thought is, this doesn't seem that great. Everyone was kind of grumpy. <laughs> no, no one was like, hey, we made it to space. Like everyone was just kind of doing their thing. And it was one other rookie on my first flight. This guy, Dwayne Carey, F, uh, Dwayne Carey is a digger, was his nickname. He's an F-16 pilot. He was my astronaut classmate. The other folks had flown in space multiple times. We were the only two rookies. And so, you know, I, I kind of got a moment with him. I was like, what the hell's going on here, man? Everyone's like, kind of grumpy. You know, this is supposed to be fun. And he goes, I don't think they're feeling well. And that's what it was. Everyone's just kind of, like, uh, you know, kind of trying to do their thing and hold out until it's time to take a, a shot of Finnegan and go to sleep, which is like an ant thing. They're like, oh, let me get the, get a shot delivered right to the butt. That was uh, to help us go to sleep and, and get the, get over the nausea. But that first day is kind of like you're not feeling that great. And so that's that. And you, you've lived through launch, so that was good. And it was, a, you know, especially the first time I was, you know, as a rookie, not trying to do any, you know, make any trouble, you know, not, not you know, do any rookie mistakes and, break stuff or cause any trouble, just kind of learn from my crewmates. And um, uh, so there was a bit of, I guess, you know, the stress involved with that or, you know, the serious, but it wasn't like overburdening, like freaked out stress. It was just kind of like, we have to do our job and execute our plan. And I was getting used to it. So it took me, I felt like a couple days until I started feeling better and, uh, and, and at home and could really execute the plan. We typically don't do anything on the first few days, that is intense. So we don't we didn't do our rendezvous until day three. We didn't do any of the spacewalks until day four. So they give you a little bit of time to get acclimated. So after those first couple of days, I felt pretty acclimated. Um, I felt you know I, I you know I didn't I wasn't going to be away for that long. You know, just a couple of weeks. Um, so I we didn't have much contact on those flights with our with our family until the end of the flight. We had like a private family conference where we kind of skyped. I don't know what they called it back then. I don't know if Skype or Zoom didn't exist back, you know, 20 years ago. But we would have that little conference with our with our families and, uh, and at the end. And that was pretty much And we had email uh, that we had an email sync that would go up once a day, or, um, once in the morning and once at night. So we could keep up with things. And you could say, I want to keep up with the sports teams or whatever news you wanted to. So you'd want to keep that connection. But for a couple of weeks, it, uh, it's, it's of intense activity for my flights, it wasn't like you necessarily um, were, you know, really missed home. I mean, you kind of did, but um, I, I missed Earth. I think I, I was ready to appreciate Earth, being around lots of people, and there's no weather in space, and you see the beauty of the planet when you're up there, and then you get to engage it when you get down on Earth, which is kind of cool. You have a different perspective on things. So that was all cool. But as far as, like, the mental wellness of it, that, again, just like the physical wellness for just being in space for a long period of time, that became more of an issue, Thomas, when we were looking at the six months in space thing of like the, it's more like you're on an expedition. 
And so uh, things have gotten better in that way. The connection with home was really important. So being able to call home, they started with an internet phone that you could get calls from. Um, if you ever get a, a, a call and it's a 281 area code and a 244 as the next three numbers, pick it up, it might be the space station. People <laughs> see that and they don't pick it up and they're like, oh man, the space station. And you can't call them, it only comes down here. So, uh, so, but that's important to be able to keep up with your family or your friends on special events. You could also do this like Skyping video conferencing thing. So you can watch your kid's hockey game or whatever it might be. You can kind of be kept in a loop now with that. They have instantaneous internet and email. So it's not like these sinks of information twice a day. Now it's pretty fast too. It's like a local area network that works pretty quickly on the space station. So those are all important things that keep you connected. And those are things that weren't in existence when we started flying people to the space station uh, 20 years ago. The first, first element launch to build the space station was 25 years ago, but the first crew, the first expedition crew was, was 23 years ago now. So, um, and they didn't have much going on. It was like a ham radio. Yeah. You'd go out to a shack at the Johnson Space Center once in a while and, and say hi to your friends maybe. And uh, there wasn't really very much contact. Some email, but not, not really uh, very much much contact and that got better over the years so um, but I felt um, I, I, I felt like I was really privileged to have a chance to go it was a, a, a big responsibility to go on those missions uh, to do our work together it was a great sense of teamwork there um, and it was nothing like I had ever experienced before I enjoyed being part of sports teams when I was a kid growing up and but that like sense in the locker room that camaraderie that you had I, really didn't have that um, until I got back at NASA. And that's what it was like, is hey, we're gonna do this really cool thing. We're gonna do it together. We can only be successful together. It's not gonna be, you know, individual accomplishment is important, but really we have to we have to work together to get this goal accomplished, just like you would on a sports team. And so that was that was very rewarding. Uh, but overwhelmingly, by the way, the way I felt was the, the viewing of our planet from up there. Uh, I felt like I was looking into paradise, and uh, every every second was it was something different to look at, and so I spent all my free time looking out the window, listening to music. Um, during the spacewalks, I didn't have that much time to look around because we were busy, but those are even more spectacular because you're not looking through a window now; you're looking through a visor. You can see anywhere, so it was a, really a mix of emotions of what I was feeling. Um, you know, executing the plan because we knew that that was foremost, the most important thing. And then the, I guess the, the, the whole sort of almost spiritual um, experience of being up there and looking back at home uh, was, uh, was very meaningful. If there was anything that you could do different mm -hmm. today, if you were to go up again, yeah, can you think of anything? No, I think, um, I mean, I was very happy what I got to do. If, I think if, um, the one thing I didn't get to do is I didn't get to go to the space station, which was uh, pretty much a, the, the dominant program during my time with, at NASA. We had the space shuttle was the vehicle, but the places you would go to were either the space station or in, in my case, the Hubble. Or some place, sometimes we had science flights where they just orbit and do experiments and stuff in zero gravity. So, I mean, I wouldn't trade what I did to, to do that, but um, that, that's something I, I, uh, I would have liked to have gotten a chance to experience is, is even just a short visit uh, to the space station. Um, I was offered a long duration flight that I turned down to the, uh, to the space station. That was interesting, but it was a moment for me where I decided I had, I had had enough and I was ready to leave. Um, but if I had a chance to go again, I, I, I think it would be, um, it would have to be something that I felt was, uh, had a purpose to it. You know, I wouldn't just go for the experience, which, which I think is great for people to experience that. But I think uh, it would, for me, it would need to be like I was doing something, even if it was outreach or you know, telling a story about what it would be like or taking people along for the ride with a, you know, with a camera crew or something like that where I, could, where I felt like I was sharing the experience in some way or doing something when I got there that was, uh, that was meaningful. But, uh, but that's the one, the one thing I didn't get to do, I, I think, that, uh, that kind of stands out in my mind was I didn't get to go. To, except I did get to go for make-believe. When I was on the Big Bang Theory TV show, that's right, that's and right. I, I, we went to the space station on that. Show. So I got a patch that I, you know that was a fake astronaut patch from from that mission, and yeah. You know, so I got to go and make not not for real, but just on TV. 
Yeah, that's, yeah. I mean, that's, sec- yeah, better sec- than second place. Yeah, better than nothing. Yeah, well, one more question sort mm-hmm. of on the, uh, the health side. Mm-hmm. Would you guys have med call? Like, what was the deal no. if, uh, I mean, heaven forbid you get sick, right? Sure, or yeah. like, uh, I mean, obviously you would have to have check-ins. Like, you'd have to mm-hmm. have some form of checkup. Uh, I mean, what if something metabolic starts to go wrong? Mm-hmm. I would imagine because of the quarantines, the instance of getting sick is pretty pretty slim, but you mm-hmm. never know, right? Yeah. Um, so how would that work? And also, like, pharmaceutical intervention, like you mentioned, yeah. to, to help you get to yeah. sleep. I would imagine yeah. there's probably a significant reliance to a certain yeah. degree on pharmaceutical intervention when you're in space. There is. Yeah. Yeah, so there's a couple things there. Uh, one is the quarantine. Everyone goes to quarantine and gets sick. I don't know why that is, but it's just like, you know, it's the, the luck of the, the draw, but, but at least it gives you that time to get over it, too. Uh, so, you, yeah, you try to, and, and when, there's no germs in space. The only germs that are going to be are the ones you take with you. Yeah. So you want to be germ-free as much as possible. That's the idea behind the quarantine. Um, and, it is, uh, and you were asking about the pharmaceutical stuff. Yeah. So, so we had a med kit. So we had a few things going on. As far as, like, the check-ins go, we had a flight surgeon that was assigned to our, our crew okay. that would, uh, would follow us. And we would have these periodic checkups. And he, was, he or she was there to either, not just to make sure we were healthy, but to track how we were doing and any issue at all we had. Even our families, if our family had an issue, we would call because they want, you know, you're living at home and you want to make sure everyone's healthy and all that. So they were like a really great family doctor. And if you ever needed like a surgery or anything or a second opinion, they would get the best person in the country available to do that. They were really great at taking care. We got really good health care there, right? Because it was part of our job and it was so important to us. The, um, so in the check-ins on orbit, we would have every night on the shuttle, we would have a check-in with the flight surgeon, particularly for the spacewalk. Is anyone hurt or feeling you know, banged up or whatever it might be? But and if we had no issues, and the commander would just say no issues. And if we had something, someone would speak directly with the flight surgeon. They would privatize it. It was always over a private line. So you could have like a private medical conference. And sometimes it wasn't needed, and sometimes we would do it and, uh, and talk about whatever we had going on. So it was, there was, and it was always a flight surgeon on duty, more or less, every shift. Maybe like on the sleep shift, they had a biomedical engineer, maybe. maybe it might not have been a medical doctor, but someone who could respond to something was always down there in the control center. Um, every crew also needs a chief medical officer on board. So my first flight, we were in luck because I had a veterinarian on the crew, <laughs> Rick Linan, and he was really good uh, at taking care of humans because he was a large animal vet. <laughs> so, he had, yeah, so he had worked like on bears and stuff, but this guy was really good. So out in the field, we were doing like some rappelling and stuff like that. And I had, I smashed my hand, my hand I, I, against the, against these rocks and it was, and he took care, you know, he took care of it, cleaned it up and knew what to do and you know, all that stuff. And my friend, one of my buddies had his tooth pop out. He had like a crown or something. And he was able to get in there and get it back in his head and insert it. This guy was great. So he gave us all of our shots. He was wonderful. But there always had to be a backup, right, for, for him. And so on my first flight, it was this guy Digger that I talked about. So uh, one of the things that the chief medical officer had to do in space was give you this shot of Finnegan, which was a anti-nausea medicine and uh pretty big needle i thought you know and you get it right in the butt and uh to make to try to make it easier your flight surgeon would draw an x marks the spot on your butt in pen <laughs> that's one of the things you do before you you know before you go to the launch pad flight surgeon will if you want will give you a little pen mark of where the needle should go but rick was really great at this but someone had to give his rick his shot so digger this uh, this air force guy is uh is the backup right the pilot got that job he's the backup and they get trained kind of like an emt so he's trained how to take blood and give shots and patch you up and everything uh so anyway so he's going to give rick his shot and apparently you know rick is there in, in the right configuration to take this shot in the rear end and uh digger's got this needle in his hand and he says he's you know looking at rick's butt just and not feeling good because it's his first day and he's like you know like they're looking at it with this needle and rick kind of suspects something is going on so he turns around and he sees this, you know, this Air Force pilot looking at him like this with a needle. And he's like, give me that thing. And he grabs it and boom, gives himself his own shot in the, in the rear end. Because if you get a bad shot, it could, you know, you hit yeah. a nerve. Yep. The thing was, is like, you know, the flight surgeon's like, this is not nothing you're going to fool around with. Because if, you, you know, you poke yourself, if you get poked in the wrong spot, you can get, you know, nerve damage. Okay. And then you got a bad leg trying to spacewalk and no good, right? So we were really worried about this. So, uh, and my second flight, we didn't have a trained medical professional like the veterinarian. But we had uh, some other guys who, uh, who, who trained really well, but 
Uh, Drew Foistel, for example, was one of my crewmates. So I asked my flight surgeon, who should give me the shot? And he said, I'd go with Drew. So one of my other crewmates wanted to give me the shot. I want practice. Goes, no one's practicing on my rear end. He's giving me that shot. It's kind of serious business. You want the right guy in there doing the job. So we, they were trained to do things like I said, like a like a like an EMT. For the drugs part of it, for the pharmacy part of it, uh, we had this med kit with all kinds of stuff, like sleep medicine, right? Like uh, Ambien, or I took this thing called Sonata. I only took it for a couple of days, and then I was fine. I didn't need sleep medicine. Um, but we had stuff to keep you awake, Pro Vigil. You ever Pro, heard of this oh stuff? Yeah. I do a lot of work with special forces. So okay. Like, so Pro Vigil is like, they live on that stuff. That's good yeah. stuff. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know if I'd recommend it for people. Like, I, I only, if yeah. you really need it, you know, it, like it, for combat, you awake, like if it, you fall asleep, you might yeah. get shot. That's a good idea to take this stuff. And so it was the same thing in space. Like, we were able to, we could take this stuff if we needed it. That stuff. So, uh, but I didn't, t I did not take it into space. I was scared. Yeah. And Ambien freaked me out too. That was a little bit too strong for me. So I went with this yeah, last other thing. The last thing you want to see is like Bigfoot walking out. Yeah, you don't want these. I'm like, <laughs> I don't need this trouble. You know, so, uh, so, but that stuff, I, I, I did take it a couple of times on late night shifts in the control center. I take, I take like a half a pill of that stuff. But we had that to keep you awake. That was approved. Even for everything, for spacewalks, for landing the shuttle, they said it was, you know, approved for combat. Yep. So that was a good one to keep you up. We had other stuff too. And then we had antibiotics. All these antibiotics that we have just all kinds of stuff. Right? That was going to be my question. It, it, since since germs don't really mm -hmm. proliferate in space very yeah. well, was it harder to get harder to get a bacterial infection? Um, you shouldn't get one, yeah. but if you did, they had stuff to fight it. I guess the the uh, one issue would be like if you got dehydrated, there's a greater chance like for um, for a urinary tract oh, yeah. infection. Yeah. We've had that happen. Yeah. So that's not a good thing. I don't know. Is that bacterial? What is that? Yeah, it can be. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Yeah. And then, I mean, so, I would imagine that, I mean, if you have a, I mean, you can still go, go septic. I mean, you can still have your own bacteria cause an issue okay. too, right? So yeah. I guess, uh, but if, if you, if you went septic, I mean, that's a good question though. If, if someone went septic or yeah. went like a severe catastrophic thing, do they bring you back down? Like what's. Yeah. No, if it's like a real thing, like, Hey, I need an appendicitis operation or something like that, then you're coming home. Yeah. Even on the space station, that's it. So at first they thought on space station had like all the, like an operating table and all these <laughs> things. And then they're like, no, we're going to, you're going to kill people. Yeah, this organs way. are going to be we're floating up. Doing that. Yeah. Yeah. No, so it's just like, you can't train people that level. So it's, it, so you, we're coming home. If someone needs like emergency surgery, we're coming home or something. Like but they also they want to make sure you don't need, they're not going to need that. Yeah. So you want to be really fit and healthy. Uh, and so we've never had anything major like that. Uh, and if you go to people going to Mars and places like that, you're not coming home. You're staying there. Yeah. Even the moon is going to be harder to get back from. So and that's relatively closer, um, but uh, then much closer than Mars. But that's going to be difficult. So they'll probably have to, but that's a consideration. But the way they've gotten around that is making sure you're as healthy as possible, making sure you're not going to have a heart attack or anything like that uh, over the time you're going to be in space. So that's the way they handle that. The, the, the medicine thing, um, they would give us a bag of drugs, and had, we had to test everything. You had to take it. You had to take to see if you had any reactions to it. So I remember I was with my, my buddy Drew, and we showed up. And the pharmacist was a very nervous, you know, like a very nervous pharmacist. Like oh, I'm giving you all these things, and she goes, "You have to take all. Make sure you take all of them. This is how you do it." And he goes, "Make sure you take all of them." And, and my buddy goes, "Can we take them all at the same time?" And he's like, "No, <laughs> don't do that. Oh God, don't do it. Like, you know, you're gonna like take a whole bag of that." So she goes, "Oh no, don't." You know, she was just kidding, but it freaked her out. It was kind of funny. Um, but we would we would test all that stuff, so we had all that available. I remember I had like a Z pack with me, yeah. just in case, because I was getting over a cold both of my flights, and I had and that stuff was with me in my in my pocket. There were a couple of things that I had, like just like for like Motrin, uh, sleep medicine, a Z pack. Yeah, that's what I had close by. Claritin, which is like an allergy medicine, but that I was very worried about. Um, I would I would shoot Afrin. Mm -hmm. Because you have to depress. You mentioned pressure change. We haven't talked much about that, but but you're going from uh, a, you you would go down to a lower pressure to spacewalk. So you're at you know, 10.2 on a depressed cabin or 14.7. You got to go down to 4.3 psi. So that's lower pressure there, and then you're going to have to come back up to the cabin pressure, and you have to be able to clear your ears fairly easily because you can't get to Valsalva. You're still inside your spacesuit. You can't get to your your face with your with your fingers. Mm. So we had a Valsalva pad, which was like a, a uh, these two pads where I had two of them, kind of where you could jam your your nostrils in there to clear hmm. to clear your ears. And uh, one of the flight surgeons had worked with divers, with Navy divers, 
And the, the, way, the way he explained it, the way they came up with that idea for the pad in the, in the helmet was that with Navy divers, they had nothing to, to you know, they're in one of these big uh, helmet kind of walk around the bottom of the ocean things or whatever. And he would jam their nose into the side of the helmet somehow in the ring of the helmet. And that wasn't very comfortable or not that effective either. So, uh, but you needed a clear head. If you had a, a, you know, a sinus infection or cold or something like that, it'd be really tough to clear your ears when you're going through that kind of pressure change. So I would always shoot, shoot up some Afrin, and I would also take a decongestant, too, just to make sure I could clear. Probably a smart move. Was it? Yeah. Was there uh, ever any use of, like, hyperbaric oxygen, or is that kind of used when probably only if someone's dealing with the bends or something? Yeah, like that, yes. we had a chamber, actually, which was uh, by the pool. So, you know, and that... I think some hospitals have them. I don't, they're not very common, right? Uh, yeah, I've got one out there. That's what you, you walk do, right by. You do, really? Yeah. Get out. So, so if you have the bend, you have people coming in here with the bends? No, my, well, that, I mean, we got it because my, treatment? my wife had a, a TBI, and it's, oh, a, it's okay. a common treatment. So if you think about pressurization, yeah. think, about like a, think about like a can of Coke, right? Yeah. If you got a bottle of it, yeah. when they put the CO2 in it, mm -hmm. if they didn't pressurize the bottle, mm -hmm. then obviously the CO2 wouldn't dissolve into the liquid, right? Mm -hmm. So essentially what you're doing, it's the same kind of thing with trying to mm -hmm. saturate uh, oxygen in your mm -hmm. blood. So like normally oxygen rides on a red blood cell, mm -hmm. but when you pressurize your body to 100 feet below mm -hmm. sea level, then when you also breathe oxygen, so we've got uh, yep. a compressor to at least breathe 92% mm -hmm. oxygen, you can't yeah. get to, you know, but either way, so then you're pressurizing your body, you're breathing oxygen, yeah. you're able to saturate the plasma with oxygen yeah. without having to be at the mercy of the limitations of a red blood cell. Yeah. So for the sake of like a TBI, it allows a maximum amount of oxygen to cross through the blood brain barrier and heal mm -hmm. a wound. In the brain is obviously a hard place to heal a wound. Ah. So they're used mainly in like, you know, they're using them for all kinds of different recovery and things cool. like now. So they're, and they're actually becoming kind of a performance aid, which is pretty neat. Yeah. Um, but yeah, typically like in your case, it's like if someone's yeah. like major pressurization changes yeah. and they're getting the bends, they have a nitrogen bubble, you know, things yeah. like that. Yeah. We had, we had, uh, we did have one of those chambers in case, in case you did, cause we were down, uh, either within our spaces for like six hours at a time. And we also did a lot of scuba diving down there. And so I, as well to train, you know, to, to understand what the mock-up looked like and get ready to practice these spacewalks in the spacesuit. And uh, so, yeah, so we had dive tables and we also, we do a lot of flying because that was part of our training too. So there's all these rules of what you could do. If you had a, an incident, like you had the bends and you would go to that, to that hyperbaric chamber, yeah. But we also had an altitude chamber where you could go to high, to, to train for being at a higher altitude and understanding your symptoms. If you go to, if you, you're in an unpressurized, like if you lose pressurization, sometimes it can be a bit insidious where you won't realize it and you'll pass out from, you get hypoxic mm -hmm. without knowing that that's happening to you. And so there's going to be symptoms that you'll recognize. And the way you learn to recognize them is they put you at altitude and have you drop your oxygen mask. So you, so you can recognize those symptoms. Yeah, that'll um, humble you real quick. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, yeah, it was kind of an interesting experience. We would, there would be refresher training. Every two years we had to do that just to remind ourselves is what it was like. They also would like, uh, they exposed us to carbon dioxide poisoning so we could recognize those symptoms as well because sometimes the scrubbers don't work as well and that can sneak up on you. But you will get symptoms. You might get a headache or whatever it is. Everyone's a little bit, you might get angry. All these weird things can happen to you with that. So they would, at the, end the, at the end of the day, they would have us breathe like CO2 and <laughs> to see what it would be like in case we, because the sensors didn't work as well as you would like. Typically when it sends CO2 in the atmosphere, that's too late. And uh, so you want to, you're, you're, at least at that time, the human was the best sensor for, for discovering CO2. So they would, in your spacesuit or in the cabin. So they would train us for that as well. And for the dive, like I remember there was one time I needed to fly the next day. Usually it's a 24 hour restriction after you're in the pool at that high pressure to go to the, to go to the high altitude in our airplanes, which were unpressured. Well, they partially pressurized cabins, but we needed to breathe uh, O2 over uh, 10,000 feet. And you needed to have the oxygen mask on. Um, but even then that could be a, a problem. You can get the bends right for your compressors. You're saying underwater 24 hours, you're pretty much good to go. At least that's what our, Ours rule, our rules were, and uh, uh, but I needed a fly so we could breathe 100 percent oxygen for like four hours to get all that, you know, get all that back, rid, rid the body of the nitrogen, and get all that O2 back in there, um, so you wouldn't get the bends going to the high altitude.
So we had all that stuff. Yeah, all, the good, all the good stuff. stuff. You got Provigil, you got, Pro you got all yeah. the fun stuff, that man. Stuff, I, haven't, I haven't taken that in a long time, but man, that's Hopefully you don't need amazing. to, I mean, unless you plan to go into combat or something, but yeah. yeah that's, no, but that's, I remember my, my crewmate, Megan MacArthur, and I didn't drink caffeine back then, I do now, but but I, you don't want to be dependent on anything when it's hard to get to it, you know? And it's, yeah, you know, right. You know, you have to, I just want to be, a lot of field training, and you have to start over the fire to make him coffee, some of the guys, like, I don't need this headache. So I just was caffeine free for most of my time at NASA. My friend Megan was the same, and uh, she took a pro. We were in the in during this time we were each take. You could take whatever you want. You could take like you know, uh, and then you just had to test a pill a day, right? It could be a vitamin. It didn't matter what. A, but she was like acting really crazy. I'm like, what's going on with you? She goes, I took one of those damn pro vigils. <laughs> and she was like really buzzing around. So Clean uh, the whole house. But yeah, they're, 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 they were an expensive pill back then too. I don't know if there's a generic version of that that's cheaper but that would... i think there is now but it's yeah it's uh that's that's a yeah. common one the military i mean that's just like across the board that's, that's just kind of like that's standard still, operating still procedure today oh you're tired oh you still need to work yeah yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, take, like... yeah no it was all right you could do that um but i don't know if i'd recommend it for everybody because no, i really no. yeah well yeah. mike we're gonna wake you up where can everyone find your uh, find your book first and foremost, sure. and where else can they find you? Um, so the books available at uh, different bookstores or around the around the world, I guess it depends. Let's stick to the country. It's in some other countries too, but here around the U.S. and uh, you know available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and other places. Uh, they can find me um, at my website, mikemassimino.com. I'm also the first guy to tweet from space, so I have a pretty active Twitter uh, account. Uh, Astro underscore Mike, Mike uh, Astro Mike Massimino on Instagram and Facebook. I'm on LinkedIn too. My website, they can reach out to me if they want to send me a note or something. There's a way to, there's like a contact little yes. button they can, they can, uh, they can press that. Well, we've got a couple uh, events coming up next week, and I don't know when, when the, for the book launch in New York City, and you can find out about that on the website. But I've got a, an event, a book event coming up at the Explorers Club next week maybe this doesn't make any sense because i don't know when this is coming out but but the book launches on on uh, on the 5th it's available for, for december 5th available for pre-order now and uh i'm going to have an event at the explorers club on the 4th of december and then at the intrepid museum on the 6th of december after the launch so yeah well mike so anyway appreciate thanks it for having me you bet man. i really appreciate it thanks for, for sure thanks, thanks, appreciate it